Hello, and welcome to Based on a True Story, the podcast that compares your favorite Hollywood movies with history. If you're listening to this on the day it's released, then today is December 7th. And of course, we all know about December 7th, 1941, the day of infamy, the surprise attack on Pearl Harbor. What you may not know, though, is that Pearl Harbor was not the only American base that was attacked by the Imperial Japanese Navy that day. Today, we'll be learning more about that as we cover the movie Wake Island. To help us separate fact from fiction in the movie, we'll be chatting with Professor Gregory J.W. Irwin from Temple University. Gregory is a military historian who has written two fantastic books about Wake, including Facing Fearful Odds, The Siege of Wake Island, which is a book that many consider to be the definitive account of the battle. Now, if you haven't seen the movie Wake Island, well, that wouldn't surprise me. Actually, it would surprise me more if you had seen it. You see, today's movie was released in August of 1942, so just months after Wake Island was attacked in December of 1941. As you can imagine, the timing of the movie makes its historical accuracy a bit suspect since it was, for all intents and purposes, a war propaganda movie. And with that in mind, I do want to give you a heads up that there is some racist terminology in this episode as Gregory recounts some of the terms used back then. And he's real good at giving a heads up before that happens, though. So when you hear that heads up, feel free to skip ahead if you'd like to avoid it. Before we connect with Gregory, let's set up our game. Two truths and a lie. If you're new to the show, here's how it works. I'm about to say three things. Two of them are true, and that means one of them is a lie. Are you ready? Okay, here they are. Number one, Wake Island was compared to the Alamo by American newspapers. Number two, the first wave of Japanese bombers attacking Wake used cloud cover so they weren't detected until they were a few seconds from the airfield. Number three, Wake's defenders did not manage to destroy some of the Japanese ships like we see in the movie. Got them? Okay, now as you're listening to our story today, your challenge is to find the two facts scattered somewhere throughout the episode, and by a simple process of elimination, you'll be able to find out which one is the lie. And of course, we'll do a recap at the end of the episode to see how well you did. All right, now it's time to chat with Gregory J.W. Irwin about the historical accuracy of Wake Island. In the opening text, the movie explains that the action was recorded as accurately as possible, but the characters are fictional. And I, I like that because movies don't usually admit that these days. So the main characters that we see in the film consist of the guy in charge of Wake, Major Caton, the government contractor, Shad McCloskey, and the troublemakers, Privates Randall and Doyle. I'm assuming they're all fake since that's what the movie says. So who were the real people on Wake Island? Well, let me run down the roster. Major Jeffrey Artillery Caton, played by Brian Donlevy, represented Major James P.S. Devereaux, who was the commanding officer, Wake Island Detachment, 1st Defense Battalion. And he got uh, to Wake on October 12th, 1942, a couple months after the 1st Marines arrived, in fact. And then the person he meets on the plane flying in, Shad McCloskey, uh, that Albert Decker played, he represents the general superintendent for contractor specific naval air bases. This was a, a part of a civilian conglomerate, and they were engaged in an 11th hour effort to transform Wake into a naval base. That man was Nathan D. Dan Teeters. He got to Wake long before the uh, Caton character. Uh, he arrived on uh, at Wake on January 10th, 1941, with a uh, the first 77 men in his uh, in his work group to kind of get things started. The senior naval officer in the movie, Commander Roberts, played by Walter Abel, that represented Commander Winfield Scott Cunningham, who was the island commander. He was actually the guy in charge. He was put in charge of Naval Air Station Wake Island after it was activated because he was a naval aviator, and that was the law back then. Only naval, naval aviators could command naval air stations. He arrived at Wake right before the war, November 28th, 1941. The head uh, Marine pilot, uh, Captain Bill Patrick, played by Damien O'Flynn. That represents Major Paul A. Putnam, the commanding officer of Marine Fighting Squadron, or VMF-211, who got to wake on December 4th, 1941. The ace pilot uh, that's uh, portrayed in the movie by McDonald Carey, 
closest thing uh, that I can think of uh, in the squadron was uh, Captain Henry T. Elrod, who also arrived at Wake with Major Putnam on the 4th of December. He will receive a posthumous Medal of Honor for his valor in the fight for Wake. And then we got uh, two uh, enlisted Marines, uh, Private Joe Doyle, played by Robert Preston, Private Aloysius Case, Maxi Randall, William Bendix. They're the comic relief, and uh, you know they're played as Brooklyn bums. I interviewed about 80 uh, of the, of the uh, uh, men who defended Wake Island in the real battle, and um, most of them Marines that I, that I interviewed. And if the film really wanted to have been accurate, at least one of these guys would have been a Southerner because a large contingent were uh, Texas boys, refugees from the Oklahoma Dust Bowl and things like that, uh, Louisianans, what, what have you. I mean, they, they, they were Marines from all over the, all over the country, but, but Southerners, if they weren't a majority, they, they made up about half of the enlisted men. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, I didn't get that from the movie at all. <laughs> but I just assumed that those two privates were, were the comic relief, right? And so I didn't expect much reality there. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, the way the movie sets up Wake Island's defenses, it says the Marines landed in June of 1941 there. And then by October, there were six five-inch naval guns, 12 three-inch anti-aircraft guns, 12 Grumman F4, F3 Wildcats, and 385 total soldiers of the 1st Defense Battalion U.S. Marine Corps. Is that a pretty accurate description of the defenses at Wake? Overall, the first Marines arrived between August 19th and 21st, 1941. It took a couple days for them to get off their transport with their heavy weapons and gear because the seas were rough. There were 170 men and five officers. And then more contingents will arrive in, in the months between then and the outbreak of the war. Actually, Wake's human population as of December 7th, 1941, they totaled 1,742, and they were in three communities. 1,218 of these guys were civilians, 1,146. So 1,100 worked for contractor-specific naval air bases. So that those were the, the civilian workmen. Then Pan American Airways, which had converted Wake into a stop for its specific clipper route, big flying boats that flew between San Francisco and Manila, uh, Pan Am uh, established its, its presence on Wake in 1935-1936. There were 72 people working for Pan American. Uh, 27 of them were American Caucasians, and the rest, about uh, 45, were uh, Chamorros from Guam who were working as domestics and gardeners and things like that. The military contingent numbered 524. There were uh, 389 members of the Wake Island Detachment 1st Defense Battalion. So these were U.S. Marines and also some uh, one Navy surgeon and some attached medics. And then the fighter squadron, which uh, got there, uh, you know, the ground crew came in on November 28th and the pilots flew in on the 4th from the USS Enterprise, 12 pilot officers and 50 U.S. Marines. And then the U.S. Navy had 10 officers and 58 sailors. Twelve sailors manned the small boats that helped to ferry supplies from calling transport ships ashore. Wake really didn't have a harbor. And then the rest belonged to the Naval Air Station Wake Island, which was waiting for the aircraft that would operate from there. And then finally, the U.S. Army, Army Air Forces, had one officer and five soldiers on Wake. The United States military was engaged in another one of these 11th hour efforts to fly B-17s to the Philippines. They want to get more than 300 there to act as a, a deterrent to try to frighten the Japanese into not starting a war. And the route that they flew included a stop at Wake. So they stationed the six Army personnel there to man the radio and the homing signal to uh, make sure that these flights got through safely on their way uh, to Port Moresby and then up to the Philippines. I think the movie mentioned that briefly, the Pan Am connection there with Wake, the civilian side there. So I'm assuming then the militarization of Wake was relatively recent, like the movie seems to imply. It doesn't start until 1941 because of isolationism, et cetera. There's entrenched opposition in Congress to do anything that might antagonize the Japanese. 
But the military had been planning to do this all, all along. Secretly, they sent naval engineers out with Pan Am construction crews to survey the place because they knew if Pan Am could operate their flying boats, their big Martin and, and, and Boeing flying boats uh, out of uh, Wake's Lagoon, then a squadron of Navy PBYs, that was the long-range Navy flying boats that they used to scout planes, could operate there too. In fact, Admiral Husband E. Kimmel, who was commanding the Pacific Fleet on the eve of the war, he wanted to station 1,851 Marines on Wake, 760 uh, sailors, two fighter squadrons, that's 36 planes, one squadron of PBY, so another 18 planes, half a squadron of dive bombers, nine planes, half a squadron of torpedo bombers. Kimmel did send Wake the full allotment of artillery that a Marine Defense Battalion was supposed to have. So those six naval five-inch guns and 12 three-inch anti-aircraft guns, also six giant searchlights in case the Japanese attacked at night, uh, 80% of the machine guns that a Marine Defense Battalion was supposed to have. So we have 18 50 caliber anti-aircraft machine guns, 30, uh, 30 caliber machine guns. But by the time the war breaks out, less than 859 of the, mar- the Marines that were supposed to operate all those weapons were present on Wake. So they're not undergunned, but they're undermanned. Okay. So they sent all the equipment, just not all the men. <laughs> yeah. Well, that was kind of like, you know, it'll be there when they get there, you know, more or less. Yeah. Well, earlier you mentioned the two guys arriving. And I wanted to ask you about that because in the movie, the civilian contractor, Mr. McCloskey, he arrives on the island the same time as Major Caton. But even before they get on the island, while they're on the plane on the way there, we can see their budding heads. They don't really seem to get along. And then, of course, that turns into a character arc that gets resolved by the end of the film. Were there any disputes like this that we see between the Marines on Wake and the civilians who were there? Well, as indicated earlier, uh, Dad Teeters, uh, who was in charge of the civilian contractors, he got to wake 10 months ahead of Major Devro. And as far as butting heads was concerned, that really didn't happen. Teeters and his contractors, as the civilian workmen were called, they devoted their time to transforming Wake Island into a base for seaplanes, those PBYs I mentioned, land planes, and submarines. And in addition to building runways and seaplane and submarine channels and administrative offices and workshops and a mess hall and barracks that the military would eventually uh, occupy, were supposed to eventually occupy, they used bulldozers to create a road network around Wake. One thing that the movie does convey was that they were on a strict schedule. The military wanted them out of there by the spring of 1942. So they're moving as quick as they can. They put a premium, the contractors do, on speed. And workers were offered time and a half for overtime. Uh, And remember, we're coming out of the Great Depression, so these guys are hungry for money. That's why they're on wake to begin with. Opportunities for promotion, training and skilled trades closed to many workers on the American mainland. You might not get admitted to the electricians union in the States because work is scarce, but if you come out to wake, we will train you and certify you as an electrician or a plumber, what have you. And if you stay, the standard contract was, was nine months. If you, if you're there for four months, if you don't break your contract and demand to be let go, get a bonus or a raise every month. Devro's Marines, on the other hand, they were tasked with uh, emplacing and fortifying their heavy weapons and other equipment, the searchlights, the artillery, and establishing command posts uh, to handle defense uh, battalion communications. What I'm trying to say, to make it succinct, is that the Marines and the contractors worked on different parts of the atoll. They weren't bumping into each other. But the contractors, they were equipped with state-of-the-art construction equipment, bulldozers, drag lines, power tools, dynamite, a giant harbor dredge. The Marines had to do all their work with picks and shovels. And that was particularly difficult because Wake's geology can be roughly described as a thin layer of sand, maybe a couple of feet of of bright white coral sand covering a rock-hard coral shell, like hard as concrete, according to the men who who worked there. So the Marine positions, when the war comes, they stood largely above ground and had to be protected by thick sandbag walls, which had to be filled by hand. So the Marines, they see the the contractors have all this modern equipment, you know, and and they resented the the fact that they're working with more primitive tools. And they also resented the fact that the contractors, one way to keep them on this isolated atoll, which back then was like living on the moon, they had the best of food. 
their mess hall operated 24 seven and they were being served steaks and all kinds of protein to keep them working. The Marines, their cooks were lousy, according to all accounts. And there were often uh, supply shortages, snarlups uh, with the transports coming from Pearl Harbor. So they had to subsist on what they called canned rations, bully beef from World War I, hardtack or salami, which the Marines called a uh, horse. Uh, yeah, just, uh, they had that for Thanksgiving and it, the contract was having turkey. But the Marines had something that the civilians craved. Contractors, naval Pacific air bases, uh, or contractors, Pacific naval air bases, excuse me, forbade its personnel on wake, access to women, alcohol, and narcotics. It was pretty much the same for the Marines, but they got something that the, the contractors didn't. When their supply ships came through, they carried cans of 3.2 beer. So the Marines got some alcohol. Now, why is this pertinent? Well, Admiral Kimmel, you know, he he knew he only had a limited number of Marines, and there was a chance the Japanese might attack when he didn't have enough Marines on Wake. You know, he was afraid that the Japanese would pounce before Wake had its full garrison. So his plans mentioned the possibility of using civilians, some of whom were veterans of World War I to fill out Marine gun crews. Now, I haven't seen an order from him to this effect, but right after the Marines land on Wake uh, in August 1941, they begin offering heavy weapons courses to contractors during the latter's spare time. What red-blooded American boy wouldn't like to learn how to fire a 50 caliber machine gun, but to sweeten the deal, they say you'll get beer. And 150 to 225 contractors will attend these training sessions and get, you know, a couple of cans of 3.2 beer as a reward. <laughs> when the war breaks out, 186 contractors that I can count, some of whom, in fact, many of whom didn't take the pre-war uh, weapons lessons, but they volunteered to serve alongside the Marines in their various uh, gun positions. And at least 250 more found ways to support the American garrison. Teeters released his construction equipment and supplies to assist with uh, the fabrication of bomb-proof dugouts, uh, you know, digging deep. Uh, Civilians with mechanical backgrounds joined the ground crews and the Marine Fighter Squadron. Other contractors would belt machine gun ammunition after you fired it away. It had to be rebelted often by hand. They filled sandbags. They fabricated uh, camouflage and portable barbed wire barriers. They built latrines. And uh, they also replenished ammunition supplies at Marine gun positions. Finally, Teeters organized a catering service that delivered hot appetizing meals prepared by his civilian chefs to every Marine battle station twice a day. So once the guns go off, the Marines start getting really good food. (laughs) Going back to the movie, there's a scene where we see a Japanese diplomat named uh, Mr. Saburu Kurusu stop by Wake and he's... He says he's on his way to Washington to deliver a message of peace. And, of course, we know from history there was that you know message that was delivered to the government actually after Pearl Harbor was attacked. Did he stop by Wake Island first? Yeah. Uh, Saburo Caruso was a Japanese diplomat who was friendly with Americans, liked Americans. And so he was sent as an, as an envoy to Washington as things were getting tense, ostensibly to try to— um, avoid war. And I think he really believed that was his mission. But he flew out uh, via Pan American. And the Clipper stopped at Wake and he was, you know, there was a hotel there. So he overnighted with the other passengers. But there was a banquet or a dinner presided over by uh, Commander Cunningham and some of the other senior American officers. And Caruso said, I'm going to try and prevent a war. Going to do everything I can. I think it's a mistake that we should have a war. Now he'll get other orders when he arrives in Washington. But in the movie, of course, uh, you know Americans are still angry at this time about the sneak attack, as we called it on Pearl Harbor. So Caruso is played as a slimy guy who knows he's lying and trying to lull the Americans into a false sense of security. Yeah, that was definitely what I got from that too. But it does make sense just knowing the timing of the movie coming out a year after the events that that's still going to be fresh on everybody's minds for sure. Yes, definitely. Definitely. Well, speaking of Pearl Harbor, according to the movie, the news of the attack on Pearl makes its way to wake and immediately the men there are put on high alert. That means four planes are going to stay in the air at all times. And the remaining eight planes are going to be in reserve. 
And then that same day, we see 24 Japanese planes are sighted. They start bombing the American planes on the ground and seems to just cause a lot of casualties and, and chaos as well. How accurate did the movie do depicting the attack on Wake starting? The basics are there. You know, Wake was on the uh, other side of the international date line. So December 7th at Pearl Harbor is Monday, December 8th at Wake. But at 6 a.m. On, on the 8th of December, the, that Army radio van, which was on the airfield, gets a message that says, SOS, Island of Oahu, attacked by Japanese dive bombers. This is the real thing. And so you know, the word is conveyed to the garrison and to the Marine camp on the south side of the atoll and uh, called to arms, general quarters, immediately sounded by a Marine bugler who's so rattled he starts playing all the wrong calls like mess call and stuff, but he finally gets the right thing and sergeants are screaming, this is no drill, get to your gun position. So they go racing out and they reach them, they reach them pretty quickly. Part of the problem, though, is that the gun positions aren't finished. Some are not completely sandbagged. Also, there are piles of ammunition around that aren't in protected positions. So around 10 a.m., Devro calls up his various strong point commanders and says, okay, release most of your men to build up the sandbags and to create ammunition caches, you know, move the ammunition around into smaller piles. So if a bomb lands on one, you don't lose all your ammunition, all your ready ammunition. So they're engaged in that labor. And a lot of guys, you know, the alarm was sounded at six and hour after hour goes by, nothing's happening. And people are saying, oh, this is just another false alarm. There've been several alerts earlier in the autumn where nothing happened. You know, the general American racism kicks in. Well, those little blank blankety bags wouldn't have the guts to attack Americans. They'll fight Chinese, but they wouldn't dare tangle with us. And as noon was coming on, Wake often was subject to sudden rain squalls. And a big bank of cumulus clouds comes, comes creeping along from the south toward the south beach, toward the airfield. They did have four wildcat fighters up in the air. Major Putnam decided, okay, during daylight hours, continue, continuous combat air patrol, continuous CAP. But the clouds are so thick that the wildcats climb above them because you can't see anything if you're in the clouds. The only trouble is that there were 27, not, not 24, but 27 Mitsubishi G3 M2 Type 96 attack bombers. For your listeners, if any are, are uh, up on the Pacific War, they probably know them by their allied code name. They're called Nell Bombers, but they're 27. And they fly into the cloud bank and they use that as cover. And they appear right over Wake's south beach at 11 58 a.m they're about 15 seconds away from the airfield and when the americans first see them they can't believe it's the enemy i interviewed one marine sergeant who was uh, on major Devereaux's uh, in his in his command post manning the the field phone and, and there was a marine on the water tower which was the highest point on wake 50 feet off off sea level who called in and said hey malik look at the planes and Sergeant Malik joked, are they ours or theirs? And the voice came back and it wasn't in, in a joking tone now. He said, they got to be theirs. They're dropping bombs every GD one of them. And they hit the airfield. Eight planes on the ground, ground crews clustered around them, refueling, arming them. Pilots go running out trying to get the planes off the ground. It's a massacre. VMF-211 loses 32 personnel. Half its personnel are killed and wounded including three pilots and 16 ground crew guys who are either killed in action or mortally wounded in action. Seven planes are destroyed. The guys on combat air patrol, they're, I mean, they're the, 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 ground, the radio on the ground, the, the ground air radio, they're trying to calm down, but the radios are malfunctioning. And they don't know anything about this until their regular uh, tour of duty ends and they come down to land and then they find the airfield in flames. Most of the aviation fuel's burning. One of the landing wildcats strikes debris on the, on the airfield, so it's damaged. It's not flyable for the foreseeable future, so they're cut from 12 fighters to four in the twinkling of, of an eye. And most of their parts, all their repair manuals, a lot of their fuel and ordnance and ammunition, gone. 
It's devastating. The Japanese also hit the Pan Am Hotel and killed 10 Chamorros, 10 of the Guamanians there, too, that first day. It sounds like there's a lot of parallels to Pearl Harbor. Of course, there was a lot more at Pearl and, you know, much, much, much bigger there, but just caught off guard, just things. I mean, with the airfield just being pretty much knocked out right away. Yeah. But at, at Pearl, they really didn't have, well, there, there were warnings on the way. They kind of got uh, detoured. But Wake had six hours prior warning, as did Clark Field in the Philippines, where most of the B-17s are sitting on the ground when the Japanese appear and pretty much wipe out the Far East Air Force under Douglas MacArthur. Well, back in the movie, after that first attack happens, we see there's a little bit of a break, break in the action and the men on Wake are trying to hide planes and they're assuming that there's going to be an inevitable second wave. And when we see that attack happen, it comes with a naval bombardment. We can see the ships off in the horizon. They're getting closer and closer. All the while, they're bombarding Wake with their guns. And then we see Wake's batteries are finally given the order to open fire as the Japanese ships start to come into range of, of their guns. And we do see the defending guns hitting some of the Japanese ships and setting them ablaze. Did Wake's defenses manage to take out some of the Japanese ships like we see in the movie? You bet. You bet. On December 11th, 1941, so the Americans are hit by air raids, the air raid on the first day of the 8th, and their air raids the, the next two days, the Americans are hitting Japanese aircraft with their anti-aircraft guns. They're ready. Uh, one Marine flyer, Captain Elrod, shoots down two Japanese bombers in rapid succession on, on the 12th, and the Marines on the ground nickname him Hammering Hank. He becomes the hero of the garrison, Captain Elrod. But on the 11th, uh, Rear Admiral uh, Sadamichi Kajioka attempted to land 450 Japanese Marines on Wake. And his Wake invasion force, as it, would call, as it was called, had three older light cruisers, six destroyers, two transports, uh, two patrol boats, which were old destroyers converted into transports, and then two submarines. This was not the Japanese Navy's first string because the Japanese Navy was attacking Pearl and, and launching attacks on British Malaya and going after the Philippines at the same time it was stretched pretty, pretty thin. But the Japanese didn't expect much resistance at Wake. In fact, the Japanese bombers who had hit Wake on, on the 8th, the 9th, and the 10th, they claimed, yeah, we've taken out the Marine defenses. Like a lot of airmen, they exaggerated their achievement. Yeah, it will be a cakewalk. So the Japanese who taught us the uh, danger of naval uh, air power at Pearl Harbor, they come in without any air cover. Major Devereaux, like Major Caton in the movie, he decides to play possum. The Japanese have done some damage to his, his um, defense battalion contingent. They've knocked out the range finders on uh, two of his uh, seacoast batteries, which makes it very difficult to hit anything out to sea that's moving. So he realizes that, first of all, if the Japanese have cruisers, they could sit out at like 25,000 yards and shell us without fear of retaliation. My, my five-inch guns, maximum range is a little bit beyond 15,000 yards. So he says, I mean, my only chance is to lure them in close, not only because of the disparity in ranges, but because my guys are going to have to have them at point blank range to hit anything. So he, he sends out commands from his command post. He go, climbs on top of it, in fact, with a talker to watch the Japanese through his binoculars. And, and his, he keeps repeating the command, do not remove camouflage until I give the, the word. Do not open fire until I uh, give the word. Well, the Japanese close to about 8,000 yards, and then they start firing. And, you know, no matter how well trained you are, when people start shooting at you and you don't have permission to fire back, you can go nuts. And, and this one corporal who was on the switchboard, he's inside the command post and he's relaying Devro's commands to the various uh, units, uh, the five-inch gun batteries, the three of them on wake. But he's hearing from the battery commanders, all young lieutenants. And, you know, if he didn't know much profanity beforehand, he learned it that day. Blank, blank, blank. What is he trying to do? We are hitting targets at 12,000 yards at Pearl. Good. They're, they're into 6,000 yards or they're on the beach. Uh, what is that sawed off Frenchman trying to prove? And he did not give Ma Major Devro a literal interpretation because Devro, as in the movie, uh, he was a hard nosed martinet. He was the executive officer of the 1st Defense Battalion back in Pearl, and the executive officer is the guy in charge of punishing 
you know, ne'er do wells. I mean, this guy, he was short, he was prissy, he was from an aristocratic background and acted it. He's the kind of guy who conduct uh, white glove inspections, run his gloves over your lockers. His name was James Patrick Sanat Devro, J.P.S. Devro. And again, you might want to edit this out, but his Marines behind his back said that stood for just plain sh**. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't stand the man. Devro, when he heard, you know, the battery commanders are asking permission to do not remove camouflage till I give the word. Do not. And only because they feared him so much, I think, is why they obeyed. So the Japanese are making firing runs off wake. You know, they come in at an angle, firing their guns uh, along the shore, parallel to the shore, then turn and make another run, but angling in ever closer. And Devro waited until the Japanese flagship, the light cruiser Yubari, was 4,500 yards away. And then he gave the command, commence firing. They opened up and they began connecting. Uh, the Yubari got hit and began belching smoke and then set off a smoke screen and, and it ran into it to hide itself. Other ships start getting hit. On the far southwest end of the atoll, Battery L, they fired um, three salvos. The first uh, undershot, the second overshot, the third connected. And the Marines who were there said that that ship exploded. It was a it was a light that was almost blinding. They said it lifted up in the air like a jackknife folding and broke into two halves, which bobbed on the water and and went down. So they destroyed a destroyer, but they hit three cruisers, at least two other destroyers, one patrol boat, and one transport. And the Japanese cakewalk, <laughs> damn airmen, <laughs> they, they turned and ran. They turned and ran. Now, in the meantime, Major Putnam, he had four functioning wildcats on the morning of the 11th. When the Japanese were sighted, he took them up in the air, I think around 12,000 feet. And when the Japanese began running, then VMF-211 attacked, tried to get revenge. Four stubby wildcat fighters carrying 100-pound bombs, which is not heavy ordnance. Uh, in fact, when they were arming uh, the plane, somebody said, it's impossible to sink a ship with a 100-pound bomb. And supposedly Captain Alrod said, well, if it's impossible, just take a little longer. But they will fly 20 sorties against these fleeing Japanese ships. It will scare the hell out of them. They drop the bombs, they, they strafe them, they empty their machine guns, and they come back and rearm. And during one of these attacks, uh, according to the members of the squadron, it was Elrod. He dropped a bomb on a destroyer called the Kisaragi that also blew up. They think it connected with a supply of death charges. So they sink two Japanese destroyers. They kill, well, you know, anyone who wasn't killed in the explosions, the sharks got them but they kill more than 300 Japanese sailors. Later that day, a Japanese submarine uh, surfaces 25 miles from Wake and, and VMF 211's on patrol, and one of the pilots sinks that too. Five Marines were, were lightly wounded. Five Marines were lightly wounded. When the word got back, this was America's first tactical victory of the war. It was the first unsuccessful, I think the only unsuccessful amphibious attack mounted by either side during the war. It was the first really good news that the United States had gotten since Pearl Harbor. Our guys are hidden back. We made the enemy run. People on Wake, uh, just like the Japanese airmen, they thought that they did more damage to the enemy. You know, we, we sank a cruiser too, you know, and stuff. So inflated figures get to uh, get to the American public through Navy Department press conferences. But the basic fact is, yeah, they routed the Japanese and they humiliated the Japanese. The Japanese, they couldn't believe it. Wow. And it sounds it sounds like even if uh, they may not have been on board with Devereaux's plan initially, but it sounds like that was a major reason for why it worked. I mean, it, waiting for them to get closer. So they're almost point blank range. The guys who told me the nastiest things about Devereaux, they respected him. They, they said he knew what he was doing. Yeah, they, they gave him full credit for that playing possum tactic. Back in the movie, we see a montage of newspaper headlines. It's Time is passing. One of the headlines says, you know, Wake's defenders repel a sixth attack. And then the next one says, an, an eighth attack. It's the 20th of December, and then it's the 21st. And Wake's defenders are still holding off the Japanese. So we get the idea that there were a lot of attacks and a lot of them being able to hold off the Japanese. How many attacks did they have to defend against? That montage is pretty good. When I was researching my book on, on the fight for Wake Island, I went through the New York Times on microfilm, and that's what you saw every day. The third, the fifth attack on Wake, Marines repel seventh attack. These are all air raids. 
except for the landing attempt on December 11th. These are all air raids. And Wake sustained 13 air raids between December 8th and December 19th, 1941. These came mainly from Japanese medium bombers based uh, in the Marshall Islands, about 500 miles to the south. There were uh, a few that were uh, conducted by Japanese flying boats, Kawanishi flying boats. It carried really big bombs, but only a few flying boats would participate in these uh, attacks, whereas the, the Nell bombers, the medium bombers, there'd be 27, 24, that kind of thing. These caused comparatively few casualties uh, and little significant damage. I mean, the worst day was the first day, but they imposed a strain on the garrison's nerves. You know, being shot at is like having and surviving is like having a near crash in an automobile. And if you're doing that day after day after day, it's going to wear on you. The Atoll's 14th air raid occurred on December 21st. And that was especially ominous because it was conducted not by land-based medium bombers from far away. It was conducted by carrier bombers who had a limited range. And that uh, turned out that they flew from the Soryu and Hiryu, which had been diverted from the carrier force that attacked Pearl Harbor. After Wake held out, they sent the carriers and, and their escorts in to assist. That told the Marines that the Japanese Navy is back in the vicinity. That, 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 that means that there's got to be a, a reinforced Japanese naval force closing in on the atoll. And that... Uh, Everyone could expect another invasion attempt. 18 uh, Nell bombers from the Marshalls subjected Wake to its 15th air raid later on the 21st, and the Japanese carrier planes returned on December 22nd to execute the 16th air raid. So up until the day before Wake fell, 16 Japanese air raids in all. Wow. Well, and you, when you're talking about the newspaper, it lines in perfectly with what you were saying earlier about how this was the good news after Pearl Harbor, like they're able to, to withhold it. So, of course, that's going to be what the papers are going to put as the front page headlines. It's immediately compared to the Alamo and the public is just, you know, every day is Wake still there? Is Wake still holding out? In fact, when the war first broke out, FDR, you know, he gave a, a talk and he squared pretty much with the American people. He said they've attacked uh, Pearl Harbor. He didn't give the exact amount of damage the enemy inflicted. They've bombed the Philippines. They've bombed Wake and they've bombed... Uh, Guam, and we don't think they're going to hold out very long. They've shelled Midway. And then, bam, the, uh, on the 11th, Wake repels the Japanese. So Americans were psyched. These were there. It was like, you know, being a Mets fan <laughs> in 1969, we're winners again, you know. So, <laughs> leave it to the Marines, you know. And there's a scene in the movie where one of the American pilots, uh, Captain Patrick, he's shot down. He jumps from his plane and while he's parachuting down, a Japanese plane shoots him while he's in the air. And from below, Major Caton is watching this and he mutters, you know, the dirty whatever under his breath, as if the idea of shooting a pilot who has ejected is taboo. But of course, you know, they've also launched these surprise attacks. So I was curious, did that sort of thing happen? And was it a taboo thing to do according to the rules of war at the time? Well, you know, according to glamorized tales of World War I fighter aces, you're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to salute uh, your foe as his plane's going down or whatever. But uh, this scene is pure propaganda. It depicts the last day VMF-211 was in action. That would have been the that air raid of, of the 22nd when, oh, about three dozen or so Japanese carrier planes attacked. And uh, there were two Wildcats left. And I interviewed uh, one of the pilots, Captain Froiler, who was one of those two planes. He managed to knock down one dive bomber, and then he attacked the formation head on. And he mu his tracers must have connected with fuel lines because the plane in front of him blew up when he was about 50 feet away. He flew through the explosion. And it was like being showered with shrapnel, and, and the flames burned away his control circuits. His plane was inoperable, so he made a dive to get back to wake. A fighter got on his tail. And even though his plane was in difficulty, fired at him and he got wounded, but he survived. He managed to land on wake and his engine conked out just as he reached the, the runway. The other pilot, a Lieutenant Davidson, got on the tail of a Zero fighter and a Zero fighter got on his tail and he was last seen flying out to sea. So we assume the Japanese shot him down. He was never heard from again. Once this war gets going in the Pacific, it's a war... Well, John Dower wrote a wonderful work about it called War Without Mercy. It's a race war on both sides. The Americans and the Japanese think that they are racially superior to each other. They depict their enemies as, as animals, as barbarians. 
there's little taking of prisoners on both sides. You know, you, you read about the Battle of Iwo Jima and the Japanese garrison there was like 21,000 men, 200 survived. The Japanese were trained not to surrender, but uh, still, you know, it gives you an idea of, of the character of that war. So I imagine if someone had a chance to shoot at a parachuting pilot uh, from either side, they probably would have taken it. And one of those shots where we saw the, the planes fighting, I noticed they actually had a biplane in the Japanese planes that were attacking. Were they still using biplanes or was that just something where in the movie they just needed <laughs> needed a plane and it filled it in? <laughs> I, I don't know where they got that stock footage. The Marine Corps, because it, it was so happy to have this movie being made, lent the production company Paramount everything it needed, including flyable uh, Wildcat fighters and the various forms of artillery and uh, machine guns and even real Marines uh, to act as extras for scenes of close order drill, etc. cetera. But um, no, uh, the Japanese weren't flying outmoded planes like that. On the other hand, up until a few weeks before VMF-211 went to wake in November of 1941, its pilots were flying the outdated Grumman F-3F-2 biplane. Americans were flying biplanes in, in, in no, uh, October, November 1941. And, you know, they, they get these new planes before they're sent to wake. None of Major Putnam's pilots, including him, had flown more than a few hours in, in this aircraft. So they really didn't know what it could do, you know, in combat conditions. And none of them had fired a machine gun or dropped a bomb from one of these new monoplanes. And that's not the condition you want when you send men to war, when you send flyers to war. It's not the ideal way to fly into a war. So the fact that they managed to do what they did with what they had and, and to have it, you know, have, have the number of planes at their disposal reduced drastically with the first shot. It's a real testimony to the caliber of those Marine pilots and, and the ground crews and the civilian assistants that helped keep VMF-211 flying until almost the very end. In the movie, there is a brief mention where we see the Japanese sending a message to Wake and they demand an immediate surrender. Major Caton's reply in the movie is simple come and get us. <laughs> Was there any communication between the Japanese and the men on wake like the movie shows? Hell no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, the Japanese came waltzing in. It's going to be a cakewalk. And they got their tail feathers scorched. And when they came back, they came back uh, with a heavily reinforced task force. But they didn't summon the American garrison to surrender. They tried to sneak in. In fact, in their determination not to advertise their presence as long as possible, there was no a preliminary naval bombardment. They sent the landing parties ashore under the cover of darkness, let darkness and the sound of the surf protect them. They had uh, 900 uh, Japanese Marines in their first wave, another 1,000 Marines waiting to go ashore if the first wave didn't get the job done. Uh, I mean, that was twice the number. They had 450 when they went on the 11th, so 900 in the first wave a thousand more. And Admiral Kajioka, if things went really haywire, was determined to take his six destroyers, run them aground, and throw the crews into the battle with rifles. So, I mean, they, they were not going to be humiliated a second time. And they meant to try to take the Americans, if they could, by surprise. Now, radio messages, there was one that supposedly came out of wake in the middle of the siege. According to a newspaper report, uh, Pearl Harbor asked the garrison, is there anything you need? And uh, according to this story, and the language is racist, so I apologize for that, but their reply was, send more Japs. And that made big headlines. Oh, yeah, Marines, they, they just, you know, they don't care. They just send us more Japanese. We'll kill them all. What really happened, I, I met one of the three Navy ensigns who who were helping to man the lone radio that was left uh, toward the end of the siege. And they said, well, you know, when we were broadcasting, we would send out nonsense words so that Pearl could home in on our signal. And then we'd give them the legitimate coded message. So, you know, now is the time for all good men to come to our country, send more, send more beer, send more Japs, you know, until, <laughs> until somebody on the other end said, Oh, we got you. You know, okay. And then, then, then they do the serious stuff. So, this one Anson said, yeah, that's what we did. And that's somebody probably thought this is good propaganda. This is what we'll tell the press, you know, so that, you know. again, yeah. Just uh, using it for publicity and, and propaganda at the beginning of the war. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're at war. You got to get, you got to get the people behind it. In the movie, by the time the Japanese get to the point of boots on the ground, I believe it was actually the first time that we saw boots on the ground in the movie. They seem to make 
pretty quick work of Wake's defenses. We see a few shots of the American defenders shooting at the Japanese soldiers, but they're just overrun. There's too many invaders. How well did the movie do showing the actual fall of Wake Island? Well, you know, you have to keep in mind that back in the States, no one really knew what happened on Wake that morning, except that the radio went dead. And then the Japanese later announced we've captured Bird Island. That's what they called it, Wake Island. But in reality, Wake's Marine defenders gave better than they got on the morning of December 23rd, 1941. I mean, the Japanese were really desperate to get their force ashore. They had four landing craft and then those two patrol boats, those two converted destroyers, they sacrificed them. They ran them aground so that the guys would get to shore. But the Marines heard them approaching and they reacted on the far southwest tip. The Japanese landed on the southern shore. Marines and contractors defending that sector, uh, they were under Captain Wesley McCoy Platt, who among the ground Marines was the greatest officer that ever lived. One guy said, if Platt ever told you to, to storm hell with a bucket of water, you would, and you'd ask to carry his bucket for him. He was a real Marines officer, but he approved he was a great combat commander too. He, uh, the Japanese established a beachhead, about a hundred of them. He organized a counterattack. He, he, Got two 30 caliber uh, machine gun crews, each containing one Marine and three civilians. He found some Marine riflemen and he attacked one side of that beachhead. Meanwhile, uh, one, one lieutenant got his crews from a five inch battery and some civilians who were carrying grenades for the Marines and attacked from the other side. And they wiped this, this beachhead out. They killed everybody except for two Japanese. Platt said, I want two prisoners for intelligence purposes. So they took two prisoners. One of the Marine battle cries during the siege was, and again, I apologize for the racist language, but it was, the Japs don't take prisoners. And and this was um, inspired by some of the atrocities that the Japanese were committing in China. So, you know, there's no use giving up, boys. You got to fight to the end. Well, one Marine said, you know, it it dawned on me, we weren't taking prisoners either until someone gave us orders. (laughs) (laughs) But, uh, you know, one of the, the curious things about war. Now, Further to the east, along the, 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 the shore opposite the airfield, uh, that's where most of the Japanese landed. And there, uh, Lieutenant Arthur A. Poindexter, who later became a college professor, uh, he was commanding the mobile reserve. Uh, these were uh, four machine gun crews and some riflemen riding around in a couple of trucks. They ambushed the left flank of the main Japanese landing force, inflicted heavy casualties. The Japanese turned on them and and, and drove Poindexter and his men back to the outskirts of the Marine camp. But there were a lot of guys there, cooks and and other people, you know, who weren't weren't frontline troops. And Poindexter uh, established a line of 10 machine guns across Wake's southern leg and stopped the Japanese attack. And when it became clear to him that the, the momentum, the steam was going out of the Japanese attack, He organized a strike force of 55 riflemen. He organized them into three platoons, and he launched a counterattack that forced the Japanese to give up 900 yards in two hours. Captain Platt won his ground battle, and Poindexter was winning his. (laughs) As far as they were concerned, we're beating these guys. But while Platt and Poindexter were winning their fights, communications problems caused Commander Cunningham, the Navy senior officer, the island commander, and Major Devereaux, to conclude that all those officers and their men had been overrun because Wake relied on World War I-style field phones for communications. They had some walkie-talkies, but didn't want the the Japanese to hear spoken messages in the clear. And when the Japanese landed, they had the presence of mind to cut telephone lines wherever they found them. So about half of of the Wake garrison could no longer be contacted. And Devereaux's just just assuming, okay, this— this strong point has fallen, this strong point's been overrun, et cetera. And um, Commander Cunningham, in the meantime, is informing Pearl that, you know, the Japanese have landed. Uh, they knew that there was a relief force that was on its way. They had learned that uh, on, the, on the 20th or 21st of December. And he was hoping that they say, oh, you know, help, help's only a few hours away, hold on. But Pearl had recalled the relief force. The Navy decided didn't want to risk any any ships out in waters two miles deep, because unlike shallow Pearl Harbor, if a ship sinks off Wake Island, it's gone. Pearl, you can refloat a lot of ships. So they say, uh, you know, relief isn't coming. And uh, Cunningham and Devereaux, they play hot potato. Each one knew that, uh, felt that we we can't win. 
but no one wanted to say, let's surrender. But in the end, Cunningham makes the decision. And then Devereaux goes out to inform any Marines that he thinks, you know, the few that are left to lay down their weapons, that it's a surrender. And it took him six hours, but he walks, you know, along the southern shore of the atoll, going to strong point to strong point, finding not dead Americans, but Marines who were still holding out and piles of Japanese dead when he got to Platt. Platt, um, according to some of the Marines who were there, this didn't get into the official reports, but Platt almost mutinied. Platt was saying, I'm not surrendering. And Devereux said, you know, Captain, that's an order and you will obey. And I kind of broke Platt's resistance. But they heard, the, the men around heard him say, you know, in a mournful South Carolina drawl, Major, do you understand what you're asking us to do? Because they expected the Japanese would, would execute them all. The only reason that, that, that Cunningham thought that the military should surrender was the hope that the Japanese would spare the 1,000 civilian construction workers. They laid down their arms. And when it was all over, the Japanese, they were chagrined to find out that the Americans had suffered so few casualties. Altogether, for all 16 days of the siege, American casualties numbered less than 100. 46 Marines, three sailors, 38 contractors, 10 Guamanians. The Japanese, on the other hand, sacrificed 900 to 1,000 slain, two destroyers, one submarine, two patrol boats, 21 aircraft. Uh, They lost 27, I think, attacking Pearl. They lost 21 at Wake. And what they ended up with was a barren heap of coral that, that offered them no real strategic advantages. So uh, the fight for Wake ended as a Japanese victory, but it humiliated the Imperial Navy. You know, we we should have done better and we should have won this quicker and we shouldn't have suffered the losses that we did. Yeah. And meanwhile, it also helped offer some positive publicity along the way for the American public on the other side, too. Yeah. I mean, the American public didn't know a lot of these details, but they knew that this small group of Marines had held out for more than two weeks. and. The idea was that, you know, if a handful of Marines can do this, then once this country gets into gear and mobilizes and gets wartime production up to up to snuff, we're going to win this thing. Well, at the very end of the movie, it says that there are over 140 million fighting Americans who will exact terrible vengeance for Wake Island. And that goes back to I mentioned earlier, it was released right pretty much right after it was released in August of 1942. So less than a year after the actual battle took place. What happened after Wake Island was lost and the things that we didn't get to see in the movie, I mean, other than just the entirety of World War II? (laughs) Well, of course, the smart aleck answer is America won the war, but I think you probably know that. Uh, The men who were taken on Wake, 1,600 survived the battle. And the Japanese kept about 250 construction workers on Wake to build fortifications for them. I mean, hard fortifications, pillboxes, command centers made out of reinforced concrete, uh, things like that, trenches. They shipped most of the rest out on January 12th, 1942 on a requisitioned luxury liner, the uh, Nita Maru. Uh, The POWs are put in the hold, though, no luxury uh, accommodations for them. They dropped 20 off at Yokohama for naval intelligence to uh, interrogate and the rest then went to a camp outside China and um, moving into 43 and 44 the Japanese will take some detachments out and ship them to Japan to work in their home war industries but most of the guys will stay there until May of 45 and then they'll be shipped to Japan and scattered to all all, all kinds of different camps but they're kept together for a long time so they go into captivity with their friends the servicemen go in with their officers, and they go in with Major Devereaux. And Devereaux remains a snap-the-whip martinet. I don't care what your condition is. I don't care if, if, you're, if your clothes are in rags, if they're not giving you razors to shave, uh, you know, if they're working you half to death, you're still a U.S. Marine. When an officer comes into your barracks, you salute and you obey your NCOs. In fact, he once told an NCO was having trouble enforcing discipline. He said, you get a pick handle and you use it. And don't forget, I told you that because we've got to maintain discipline. Well, by doing that, the camp in which most of the Wake Islanders ended up did not turn into these dog-eat-dog tribal disasters that uh, allied POWs inhabited in the Philippines and other parts of Southeast Asia. 
some other camps when a guy got sick, people just sat around waiting until he died or was too weak to stop them from taking his food. But it didn't happen in this camp outside Shanghai because the military infrastructure wouldn't let it happen. The contractors, they still had their foreman. And they pretty much followed the lead of the Marines. So the uh, Wake Islanders, well, of the 95,000 Caucasians captured by the Japanese during the Pacific War, talking about Americans, Brits, Canadians, Australians, New Zealanders, 33,587 were Americans, uh, soldiers, airmen, sailors, Marines. 28% of all the Caucasian prisoners died in Japanese hands. Among the Americans, the death rate was even higher, 38.4%, more than a third die. Of the 25,000 or so Americans taken in the Philippines, 41.6% died. In contrast to these chilling statistics, the Wake Islanders, they lost 243 dead in confinement, which, you know, it's a good number of folks. That was a death rate of 14.9%. And among the servicemen, the 470-some servicemen captured on the atoll, only 5.4% of them died. And among the Marines, the 403 Wake Marines, only 4.2%, 17 of them died. And these are guys who are being subjected to slave labor. They're lucky if they get three teacups of rice a day. They're being held captive by an enemy who holds them in contempt. You know, real men die for the emperor, that kind of thing. You surrender, you're weak. So. If I feel like I'll just beat the hell out of you because you don't, you don't deserve any better treatment, that kind of thing. But they hung together. One of their guys got sick. Other people would pool their rations to make him a double portion. Some guys sneaked into the Japanese warehouses and stole food, which would have brought some re-execution if they had been caught. Among the contractors, uh, uh, I found some secret diaries. The Japanese didn't permit diaries, but a lot of POWs kept them from guys saying uh, so-and-so. We think he has TB. We've taken up collection. We went to the PX. Eventually, the Japanese opened a PX for them where they overcharged. We got him two jars of peanut butter. You know, another Marine, I remember in his diary, he said, today was my birthday and the guys remembered. We only had bread covered with sugar for cake. The boys really need, needed them to remember. They gave me two packs of cigarettes, which were as good as gold. They gave me a, a, a ring made out of a quarter. You know, they, they held a, it's just great to have friends like that. Well, even if you're, you're suffering from malnutrition and God knows what, the key to survival is the will to survive. And having a group around you of people who care for you, who you know, if I go down, he'll pick me up. And doggone it, because these guys are sacrificing for me, I'm not going to die. I'm not going to let them down. And, you know, if I'm doing better and one of them go down, I pick them up. And that was kind of part of the Marine creed. You know, before World War II, the Marines were our imperial light infantry. We, whenever there were problems in what we today call the third world, the cry was, send in the Marines, send them to China, send them to Nicaragua, send them to Haiti. And they fought guerrillas who didn't have POW camps, you know, didn't take prisoners. So the Marines developed this creed as Marines don't surrender. Marines don't, don't leave their buddies. Marines bring out their wounded, Marines bring out their dead kind of thing. And that kind of translated that, that ethic that had been pounded in their heads in boot camp, that translated to the POW experience. So, you know, Marines don't like it when I tell them, you know, your organization really trains people to be good POWs because the Marines don't want to be POWs. They want to win all the time. But that discipline, that, that, that creed taught these guys how to live and live with dignity as well as to kill for their country. And they were very good at that, too. Wow, that's I mean, yeah, that that is completely unexpected. I would I don't know that I've heard stories of prisoners ha- being able to hold that morale because, you know, m- maintaining that structure perhaps to some degree, but just uh, maintaining that morale of remembering birthday. It's it's the little things. Yeah. And they they weren't all saints. Some guys got involved in, in black marketing and things like that. There were some operators in camp, but by and large, they adhered to that creed. So when they got together, at their reunions, and I attended quite a number. It's where I conduct a lot of my interviews for my books. It wasn't, you dirty rat, you ripped me off. Was, they were brothers. You know, they were, they were, it was like the years melted away and they were just so happy to be together. Wow. A bond formed for life. Yeah, really, it really did. And the movie, when they got back, you know, the movie makes it look like they all died fighting. 
And they were surprised. What? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but no, we're alive. Here we are. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it seems like they fought to the last man and, you know, held their ground as long as they could. Yeah. One Marine said to me, I didn't surrender. My officers surrendered me. I was ordered to surrender, you know, so there was still a shame at, lo- at laying down their weapons, but they had that, they could rationalize, well, I was only following orders. You know, I did, I, uh, it wasn't my idea. We've talked a bit throughout this about some of the, the propaganda side of this. And again, going back to the movie being released so soon after the actual attack happened, of course, it's going to have that propaganda. It's a propaganda film to bolster morale and, you know, try to get people to enlist. If someone were making a movie about Wake Island today, what sort of changes do you think there would be that we did not see in the 1942 movie? Well, you know, it'd be nice to show the true relationship between the Marines and the contractors, especially those who ended up fighting. Now, a lot of them didn't. Once the bombs began dropping, they ran off to the boondocks, as the Marine would have put it. The Marines would have put it. They would steal some food and they would hide. They'd dig holes and hide out. You really can't blame them, though. They weren't trained to be fighting men. They weren't psychologically prepared for war. Even trained men have to adjust. You know, as I say, there were these 180 guys who were there on the gun positions. There were about 16 that helped with maintenance on VMF 211, which was great because a good part of the ground crews were wiped out the first day to have these people who had experience with engines. And after VMF 211 lost its planes, Major Putnam uh, mustered the survivors, issued them rifles and submachine guns and said, we're infantry now. And when the Japanese landed on the South Shore, they went to meet them. And when they're moving out, these civilians, unarmed, come after them. And they say, we'll carry your ammunition, you know, because automatic weapons, you can burn off a lot of rounds. We'll carry your grenades. You know, there's a box of grenades here. Putnam said, uh, no, stay back. You know, you're, this is not a job for you. And the head of these guys was an older man. He said, Major, do you really think you're big enough to stop us? And that one civilian, when the Japanese charged VMF 211s, uh, position. They, they killed a lot of, of remaining Air Marines. Uh, Captain Elrod, in fact, uh, went into the battle with a Tommy gun, killed a Japanese machine gun crew, grabbed the machine gun, threw a Tommy gun to another Marine, and was leading a counterattack with that light machine gun, is, is screaming, kill the SOBs, when a Japanese bullet killed him. But in another one of these instances of close infantry combat, that one contractor I told you about was last seen throwing rocks at the approaching Japanese. Now, that's a story, excuse me, but I mean, that's a story of patriotism, real patriotism, love of country and, and the brotherhood of battle that uh, it would do any American good to see, I think. And I mean, there are other countries, other cultures that have stories like that, but there are incidents like that that stick out. I mean, they're crazy things. When during one air raid, the bombs drove one of the, the many rats that inhabited Wake crazy and was running around the rim of a foxhole and finally jumped and clamped its teeth down on a Marine's nose. And he was screaming bloody murder until one of his friends took off his helmet and killed the rat. So even in the middle of combat, there are things that made the guys laugh afterwards, except for the Marine with the bleeding nose. But, you know, there are a lot of stories of heroism. Lieutenant Poindexter waiting out in the pre-dawn darkness as, as landing craft are approaching him with another contractor, a fellow named Cap Rutledge, a World War I veteran, waiting out to these approaching Japanese landing craft, throwing grenades inside you know, <laughs> to stop them from getting ashore. It's just uh, a lot of stuff you see in movies and you say that can't be real. Well, some of that stuff really happened on Wake. I would love to see movies of a lot of those stories or it sounds like they could even just do an entire series, almost like you know, Band of Brothers type, you know, where you have more than just a couple hours that you do in a movie to tell all these stories. Well, you know, if you know Steven Spielberg, tell him I've got a book that he could use to adapt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> don't 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 hold your breath. <laughs> no, I know. The History Channel did make a two hour special based on it, but that's the closest I'll get to Hollywood, I, I imagine. But that that that's glory enough. Well, thank you so much for coming on to chat about Wake Island. I know you've written a couple books. The first is called Facing Fearful Odds, The Siege of Wake Island. And then the second is Victory and Defeat, The Wake Island Defenders in Captivity, 1941 to 1945. For someone listening to this who wants to learn more about this story and more of those stories, can you give an overview of your books and where they can get a copy? 
Yeah, well, the first one, Facing Fearful Odds, uh, deals with what happened on Wake Island, largely in 1941, the, the 11th hour effort to construct a, a base there, the arrival of the Marines, their efforts to fortify, and then, of course, the fight. And then Victory and Defeat tells that POW story. You know, I went into this interviewing Wake survivors because I wanted to do something new on the battle. And we would talk about the 16 days they spent in combat, and then they start talking about their POW experiences. And I thought, well, you know, I'll just humor the guys. I'll keep the, the tape recorder running. And eventually, it got through my thick head that there was this whole other great story, that they had this, this sur- unparalleled survival rate, that they won a, a victory during an even more prolonged and grueling experience without weapons in their hands. So victory and defeat tells us the, the POW story, which, uh, you know, I think deserves re- remembrance as well. I grew up with the greatest generation. I was born in 1955. Everybody's dad fought in World War II, it seemed. And as you hit the teenage years and you go through that snotty phase, oh, World War II, I'm tired of that. Who wants to hear about that? That wasn't that important. But I rediscovered the so-called greatest generation when I bumped into these wake veterans just when they were getting ready to talk. And I rediscovered what, what set this that generation of Americans apart. I mean, th- I think there are other great generations. I've helped to educate ROTC cadets who've gone on to fight and, and give their lives or, or get wounded in Iraq and Afghanistan. And that's a great generation too. But this experience made me uh, forget some of the uh, immature notions I acquired as a child of the 60s and uh, to reappreciate my cultural roots and America's cultural roots. Well, thank you again so much for your time. Thank you. It was a pleasure. This episode of Based on a True Story was produced by me, Dan LeFebvre. I'd like to thank Gregory J.W. Irwin for sharing his expertise about the historical accuracy of 1942's Wake Island. If you want to learn more about the true story of Wake Island, I would highly recommend both of Gregory's fantastic books on the topic. As he explained at the end there, the account leading up to and including the battle is all covered in Facing Fearful Odds. Then there's another fantastic story about the soldiers and civilians who were taken as prisoners of war after the battle. That's covered in his book called Victory in Defeat. You can find links to both of those books in the show notes for this episode, as well as on the show's home on the web, based on a true story podcast.com. Okay, now it's time for the answer to our two truths and a lie game from the beginning of the episode. And as a refresher, here are the two truths and one lie. Number one. Wake Island was compared to the Alamo by American newspapers. Number two, the first wave of Japanese bombers attacking Wake used cloud cover so they weren't detected until they were a few seconds from the airfield. Number three, Wake's defenders did not manage to destroy some of the Japanese ships like we see in the movie. Did you find out which one is a lie? Let's go backwards and start with number three. Wake's defenders did not manage to destroy some of the Japanese ships like we see in the movie. That is... Well, that's the lie. As Gregory explained, the Japanese lost two destroyers, two patrol boats, and a submarine. And that's not to mention the 21 aircraft and 900 to 1,000 men. On the American side, they lost less than 100 men, all their aircraft, and, of course, control of Wake Island. That means number two is true. The first wave of Japanese bombers attacking Wake used cloud cover so they weren't detected until they were a few seconds from the airfield. As we learned, the men on Wake learned about the attack on Pearl Harbor, so some of their planes were flying around looking for the enemy. But because there was cloud cover, the American planes flew over the cloud cover and didn't even see the Japanese bombers that flew into the cloud cover. And lastly, we have number one. Wake Island was compared to the Alamo by American newspapers. That is also true. As Gregory explained, the Battle of Wake Island was extremely popular in the American newspapers. That the outnumbered band of Marines could survive for as long as they did in the face of a much larger fighting force became a popular bit of news for the headlines. And as part of that, they were compared to the Alamo, where the defenders also faced a much larger force. Oh, and speaking of the Alamo, well, that'll be the next movie that we cover here on Based on a True Story next week. For today, though, that just about wraps up our time together. Before we go, the last thing I like to do on each episode is to share how much time and effort went into creating this episode. And I know that's not something that most podcasts do, and 
that's actually exactly why I'm sharing this information. If there's one thing that's surprising to most people who are new to podcasting or have never created a podcast before, it's just how much time and effort goes into creating them. So I figure maybe if you find out more about how much time and money it takes to create a podcast like mine, maybe you'll start to appreciate all the podcasts you listen to for free just a little bit more. With that said, today's episode took a total of 23 hours to create and cost $16.42 in out-of-pocket expenses. As I always do, I want to make it clear that time and cost is only my time for this one episode. In other words, that 23 hours does not include the countless hours of my guest time researching the subject matter we talked about. It also doesn't include the time it takes for me to do podcast-related things that are not part of creating this one episode. For example, the Based on a True Story email newsletter, which, by the way, you can sign up for at basedonatruestorypodcast.com slash newsletter, that takes time to put together. There's the website itself maintaining that, the social media, all those other little things outside creating an actual podcast episode that are still required to make the podcast overall. Similarly, on the expenses side, that $16.42 is just for things specifically for this one episode. It doesn't include all the podcast-related expenses that go beyond making a single episode. It also doesn't include the cost of my time. Obviously, that $16.42, if you were if I was actually taking a wage for those 23 hours that it took to create this, it would hopefully be a little bit more than $16.42. But there's a lot of stuff beyond a single episode that goes into creating a podcast. For example, the cost of the microphone that I'm talking into right now, the cost of the monthly uh, podcast hosting, that's a monthly cost. There's also the cost of the website hosting. There's also the cost of the apps. If you didn't know, Based on a True Story has an app in the Apple and Android stores. Those are not free. Both Google and Apple have their developer costs and, and maintaining those. There's costs for that as well. In a nutshell, this podcast may be free to listen to, but it is not free to create. And that's why I'm so thankful for the wonderful people who are helping to support this show financially so we can keep it going. So if you enjoyed today's episode, I hope you'll consider helping to support the next episode over at basedonatruestorypodcast.com slash support. And as a bonus, you'll get access to hours of exclusive content on the producer's feed. There are over 60 minisodes over there now with each one featuring a different fictional movie. For example, we covered the history in movies like Pirates of the Caribbean, Jurassic Park, the entire Back to the Future franchise, the Mummy franchise, and more. It's basically an exclusive podcast all of its own about how fictional movies use history and real life things to seem a little bit more believable. You can find out how to get access to that by supporting the show over at basedonatruestorypodcast.com slash support. Once again, that's basedonatruestorypodcast.com slash support. And in the meantime, if you did enjoy today's episode, I hope you'll share it with a friend. Until next time, thanks so much for listening. I'll chat with you again really soon.